Welcome. We are glad that you have joined us today. What a blessing it is for us to be able to gather, whether online or in the church, um, and we hope that you are hearing God's voice as you tune in today. We look forward to hearing Pastor Mark and the message through music this morning, and our hearts are just open, and we're excited here, and I hope that you're excited there about the new things that God is going to teach us this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the privilege that it is to get to come before you. There is excitement in community. We know that that looks a lot different now than it did a year ago. But even for us just to be able to gather together online and to be able to worship you, we are excited and we're thankful and we're grateful for the way that you have provided new opportunities for us. We ask that you would just be with us, open our hearts and our minds, that we might hear your voice this morning. We love you, and we will do our best to do all we can to be a good reflection of you. It's in the strong name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give. Strength 
to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Help me today to show me the way one day at a time. I'm only human. I'm just a woman. Help me believe in what I could be and all that I am. Oh, show me the stairway that I have to climb. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Oh, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never Help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Oh, do you remember when you walked among men? Well, Jesus, you know, if you're looking below, that it's worse now than then. There's pushing and shoving, and it's crowding my mind. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Oh, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. to do every day what I have to do. Oh, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Help me today, Show me the way one day at a time. Hello, my brothers and sisters. So nice to be with you today to share the word of the Lord. As I say each week, if there are burdens or needs that our staff could share with you in prayer, we want to do that. We want to be a part of that, and we'd like to hear from you. Just uh, email me, mark at efnaz.org. Well, today our summer series has um, <laughs> it's become a, uh, a fall series. We've been going verse by verse through the epistle of James, and, and what <laughs> great common sense he has given us for these uncommon times. Last week, if you'll remember, we looked at uh, the conclusion of chapter 4 where James warns against planning without God that we should 
make our plans, have our dreams and ambitions, but we, we should first check in with God and, and, and ask, is this the Lord's will? And then he, he warned against presuming upon the future. We don't know what tomorrow holds. Uh, life is ifty, iffy, and uh, as I said, you can't, you can't spell the word life with, without the word if. And James says our life is like a mist. It appears for a little while and then vanishes, and that's why we have to live one day at a time. And then he warned against putting off doing good. Boy, that, uh, that got all of us. James said if we do not do the good we know we should, we are guilty of sin. Wow. <laughs> well, we're in chapter 5 now, and, and James, uh, he doesn't let up. He, he puts the hammer down on, on arrogant rich people. Not, not, now, not, not rich people in general, just the people he calls, calls them uh, arrogant and self-absorbed. Uh, it, it's, it's important to note that nowhere in Scripture is wealth condemned. Money, money is an evil. What's the Scripture say? It's the love of money. Uh, that's, that's what becomes evil. God is not opposed to wealth. Um, if you look back through the Scriptures, many of God's choice servants were, were quite wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. Job was the wealthiest man of his day. Uh, then there, were, there was David and Solomon. They were the, the Warren Buffett and the Bill Gates of their day. So while God is not opposed to wealth, he is very much opposed to the misuse of wealth, and, and that's what James addresses. Now, in his day, as he wrote this, there was no such thing as a middle class. You were either very rich or you were very poor. And the arrogant rich people that he addresses were taking advantage of the poor, and the rich were getting richer, and the poor were, were getting uh, poor. Look at our scripture lesson with that backdrop in James chapter 5, and we'll begin with verse 1. A final word to you, arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament. You'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you've piled up is judgment. All the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you've done is condemn and murder perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. Now, uh, before you check out on me and think, well, okay, this sermon's not for me, i uh, I'm not in that description whatsoever. I'm, I'm not wealthy. Well, just, just hold your horses <laughs> uh, because wealth is relative. Uh, let me put some things in perspective f uh, for you. And, and I believe this, and I, 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 I think you believe it too and know it, but if you live in the United States of America, <laughs> you are wealthy, especially uh, according to the world standards. You know this, I hope. If, if you own a car, if you have a car, you're wealthy. If you have more than one change of clothes, <laughs> don't make me come in your closet and see how, how many clothes and shoes you have, <laughs> uh, you're wealthy. If you, uh, if you own your home, uh, you, are, uh, you are in the, the world's top 5% of wealth. I, I could go on and on. You, you know all those statistics. We, we certainly have way more than any of us really appreciate. So in our scripture lesson, James addresses four aspects of wealth, the accumulation of it, the appropriation of it, the allocation of it, and the application of it. The, the important thing about wealth is that we use it and, and not abuse it. So since we, we know that we really are all relatively wealthy, we've got to address then 
all four of these aspects of wealth, accumulating, appropriating, allocating, apply. So when it comes to the accumulation of wealth, first of all, James tells us, don't hoard it. <laughs> uh, any hoarders out there? <laughs> don't hoard it, but save it faithfully. Now, there's a big difference. Some of us would... Uh, some of us who would be hoarders would say, well, we're really savers, but there's a big difference between hoarding and saving. Uh, hoarding is collecting and stockpiling just for the sake of having stuff. James says in verses 2 and 3, look at this again, your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink, and you thought you were piling up wealth. <laughs> you see, when you, when you lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, do you remember that sermon from Jesus about laying up your treasures in heaven? But when we lay up for ourselves treasures on earth and just hoard it, what happens to it? It rots, it ruins, it stinks, it gets filthy, it gets stolen, the moths come in, eat it up, you know the story. Have you ever, you ever stored anything, especially like a paper product in, in your attic? <laughs> and what happens? One summer in the Oklahoma uh, heat, man, it just all kind of withers up and becomes brittle. So what's the antidote to, to hoarding? The antidote to hoarding is saving faithfully. The Bible tells us that it's wise to save for the future. Why? Well, uh, we got to think about retirement, okay? You, if you're not there, you're going to get there one of these days. You've got to think about saving to help your family. You've got to think about saving so that you can help others. You've got to, you've got to save faithfully for, for emergencies. I, I remember years ago when the weather was kind of like it is doing now. It's starting to get a little cold and, and uh, knew we were going to have to have some heat. And uh, for our young daughters, and so I went out to light the pilot light on the furnace, uh, but it wouldn't stay lit. Now, uh, I'm very, very limited when it comes to uh, handyman kinds of situations, and uh, understanding my limitations, I did the right thing, and the next morning I called a professional, and, and they came out and they said, well, <laughs> it's time to buy a new furnace. And so I called Mary at work, and, and uh, she was working at, at the bank, and, and I said, honey, do we have uh, $2,800 for a new furnace? <laughs> and it just so happened that we had a $3,000 CD that we had stuck back, and it had matured that week, and so we were able to cash that CD out and pay cash for the furnace. And, and so you see, that's what saving can do for you. God, uh, God, we always say God will provide. Yes, he will. God will help us, but we got to do our part. And so I would encourage you that if you're not saving faithfully, uh, to start considering Whatever you can, but ideally 10% of your income would, would be really good to help build some margin into your budget so that when unexpected things like uh, uh, the necessity of a furnace comes up, uh, you'll, have, you'll have a little room to wiggle. <laughs> because, my brothers and sisters, it's, it's tough to wiggle when you don't have room. <laughs> Speaking from experience. <laughs> when it comes to the accumulation of wealth, don't hoard it, save it faithfully. Second, when it comes to the appropriation of money and wealth, don't steal it, earn it honestly. You say, what, well, pastor, steal it. I, I'm no thief. I would never rob a bank. I, I would never take something that doesn't belong to me. Well, you know, there's, there's more, more than one way to, to, to take things that don't belong to you. There's more than one way to, 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 to steal than robbing a bank. There's, there's all kinds of ways these, in, in the United States of America that you can make money dishonestly. One way is you could just stiff the lender. You don't pay your bills, okay? Just keep the money for yourself. Another way to steal money is to sit in your cubicle at the office and fit around on, on Facebook all day and, and steal time from your employer. Uh, you can cheat on your income tax. That's stealing. Wouldn't it be stealing from, from the government? Did you know that when you don't pay your tithe, hello, when you don't pay your tithe, you know what the Bible says? It says you're robbing God. I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. Look it up if you don't believe me. Now, I, I've got a confession to make. <laughs> I went back last week 
you know, we're nine months into this year, and I, I wanted to check my giving record to make sure I was on track. And so I went through my, my checkbook ledger, and then I, I went online because I, those nine weeks that we were all shut down, I, uh, Mary and I started giving our tithes and our faith promise uh, on online. And, uh, and I discovered when I totaled it all up that we were behind in our giving. And I didn't want to be, be like that. So somewhere between, I don't know how it happened, but somewhere between not, not meeting for worship, because I'm usually, I like to put a physical check in the offering plate. That's my act of worship. I, that's the way I like to give. But somewhere between not meeting and uh, going on a fishing vacation uh, with Mary where she outfished me, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when you don't show up, uh, usually your tithes check doesn't show up. So uh, I'll, here's what I did. I, I got, I'm getting caught up on my giving. I just went ahead and went online and set up my giving automatic uh, withdrawal for, for until the end of the year. And uh, so making up the difference and making sure my... By the way, I, love, I, I like the idea now of giving online because I was able to check my history. Just quick, I didn't have to leave through all the checkbook ledgers. It's all right there, my, my history of giving. So I don't want to rob God. Uh, when James wrote this, here's what was happening. Employers were stealing from their employees. So they would hire uh, a group of workers and then not pay them. All they had to do was, I don't like your work. And then they just would withhold their paycheck. And there were, in that day, there were no labor unions. There were no labor laws. There was no uh, news channel that you could contact and, you know, in your corner and come out and do a, do a, a story on it. Uh, and so James says in verse 4, you've cheated and exploited your workers. They were, they were, they were stealing from the poor. So when it comes to the accumulation of wealth, don't hoard it, but save it faithfully. When it comes to the appropriation of wealth, don't steal it, earn it honestly. And then third, when it comes to the allocation of wealth, don't waste it, spend it wisely. Spend it wisely. James, <laughs> he just blasts these arrogant rich folks for the way they wasted their wealth. Look at verse 5 again. He says, you've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. <laughs> you see, the problem with wealth is the more you have, the more you take for granted. And the more you take for granted, the easier it is to be wasteful. You know, you start thinking, well, I can afford that. I, I deserve that. I'm, I'm certainly worth it. Listen, just because you can afford an electric turtleneck sweater and a fur sink, it doesn't mean that it's sensible to buy one. <laughs> Think about that for a little bit. Some of, you are <laughs> some of you are old enough to remember the TV show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, uh, hosted by uh, Robin Le Leach, and he had that Big, booming British accent, and we were all enamored. All of us common folks would gather around the TV set and watch how the wealthy would waste their, their wealth on extravagant living, extravagant homes, exotic cars, luxury yachts. You know, uh, I, I guess none of us would care to watch a show called Lifestyles of the Poor and Unknown. But since, since we're wealthy too, okay, remember, we're wealthy too. Maybe we need to, to check out our inventory in our homes and evaluate what we're not using and give some of that away, okay? I, I would encourage everybody to go through their kitchen pantry, okay? And if you've got more than enough, maybe think about collecting some of that and taking it to the Hope Center. Bring it to the church. We'll take it there for you. Uh, check out your closets and see if there's some clothes that you're not wearing any, anymore. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some clothes in your closet that just don't fit. You know, they're too big. <laughs> and uh, you've lost so much weight. And so you could donate those to the resale shop down at Reaching Our City. And it would make a difference in the lives of so many other people. Maybe you have an automobile that you don't need and you're not driving. Um, Think about giving that to a young, struggling family in need. So what's the right allocation of wealth? 
spending it wisely. Plan your spending wisely. How do you spend wisely? Well, a budget. Just one word, a budget. Have a budget. A budget helps you to tell your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. So the opposite of, 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 budget, of a budget is impulse spending. And impulse spending, uh, as my mom would say, would make you poor as Job's turkey. <laughs> so when it comes to the accumulation of wealth, don't hoard it. Save it faithfully. When it comes to the appropriation of wealth, don't steal it. Make it honestly. When it comes to the allocation of wealth, don't waste it. Spend it wisely. And finally, when it comes to the application of wealth, give it generously. Give it generously. Don't, don't abuse your wealth. wealth. Wealth doesn't entitle us to, to treat others poorly. That's, that's not right. But that's exactly what people were doing in James' day. And they, were, they, were buying, they were buying off the judges. They were circumventing uh, justice. It, it, I could go on and on. So he writes in verse 6, What you've done is condemn and murder perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. That's the wrong application of wealth. Don't ever use your wealth to manipulate others, to take advantage of others, or to hurt others. So what's the right application of it? Give it generously. Give it generously. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says, It is possible to give freely. Watch this. It's possible to give freely and become more wealthy. Now, that only makes sense in God's economy. <laughs> but those who are stingy will lose everything. The generous prosper and are satisfied. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Over and over and over again, we see in the scriptures the principle that, that give and it shall be given to you. That's God's economy. You reap what you sow. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. Now, some of you aren't experiencing the wealth that you want. And, and, and here, here may be the answer to that. Maybe you're holding on too tightly. Maybe you're holding on too tightly to what you've got. Look at this last verse again. That I, It's there on, on the screen. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. <laughs> See what happened? They, they suffered from cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> God wants us to live abundantly, but he also wants us to give abundantly and, and the two go go hand in hand and I believe I believe every one of you really want to give generously and some of you have legitimate reasons as to why you can't but some of you you can't give the way you want to give because you haven't managed your money well for for some of you money isn't the, isn't the problem uh, uh, maybe it's not a matter of unmanaged money maybe maybe it's really a deeper problem uh, 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 maybe that's just the symptom of an unmanaged life. So as we come to the end of this difficult <laughs> passage to preach and passage to receive, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Would you bow your hearts with me right now? I want you to think about your own financial situation before I lead you in prayer. Uh, have, you, have you violated any of these four principles that James has talked about? Have, have, have you been saving faithfully? Ha, are you making money honestly? Are you spending it wisely? Are you giving it generously? All, all, all of those principles are clearly in the word of God. And, and to leave out in any one of them is to short circuit God's plan for your, for your life. God wants us to use the wealth that he entrusts to us uh, for good. He doesn't want us to misuse it or abuse it. So let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you for blessing us in more ways than we deserve. We really are wealthy. We just want to pause to acknowledge that and to thank you for, for the blessings that, that we have, not only as being your children, but but uh, being able to live here in the United States of America. Help us to never take for granted 
or to misuse the resource that you have placed in our hands. I ask you, O oh God, may, may your spirit guide us to save more faithfully, to spend wisely, and to give generously. I pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit of God, and the people of God said, Amen. God bless you. I love you.